26. Sleep well, my darling. The next two days were much the same. On the fourth day of their stay, Vesper went off early to Royale. A taxi came and fetched her and brought her back. She said she needed some medicine. That night she made a special effort to be gay. She drank a lot, and when they went upstairs, she led him into her bedroom and made passionate love to him. Bond's body responded, but afterwards she cried bitterly into her pillow, and Bond went to his room in grim despair. He could hardly sleep, and in the early hours he heard her door open softly. Some small sounds came from downstairs. He was sure she was in the telephone booth. Very soon he heard her door close softly, and he guessed that there again had been no reply from Paris. This was Saturday. On Sunday, the man with the black patch was back again. Bond knew it directly he looked up from his lunch and saw her face. He had told her all the patron had told him, withholding only the man's statement that he might be back. He had thought it would worry her. He had also telephoned Matisse in Paris and checked on the Peugeot. It had been hired from a respectable firm two weeks before. The customer had had a Swiss triptych. His name was Adolf Gettler. He had given a bank in Zurich as his address. Matisse had got on to the Swiss police. Yes, the bank had an account in this name. It was little used. Herr Gettler was understood to be connected with the watch industry. Inquiries could be pursued if there was a charge against him. Vesper had shrugged her shoulders at this information. This time, when the man appeared, she left her lunch in the middle and went straight up to her room. Bond made up his mind. When he had finished, he followed her. Both her doors were locked, and when he made her let him in, he saw that she had been sitting in the shadows by the window, watching, he presumed. Her face was of cold stone. He led her to the bed and drew her down beside him. They sat stiffly, like people in a railway carriage. Vesper, he said, holding her cold hands in his. We can't go on like this. We must finish with it. We are torturing each other, and there is only one way of stopping it. Either you must tell me what all this is about, or we must leave. At once. She said nothing, and her hands were lifeless in his. My darling, he said, won't you tell me? Do you know that first morning I was going to come back and ask you to marry me? Can't we go back to the beginning again? What is this dreadful nightmare that is killing us? At first, she said nothing. Then a tear rolled slowly down her cheek. You mean you would have married me? Bond nodded. Oh, my God, she said. My God. She turned and clutched him, pressing her face against his chest. He held her closely to him. Tell me, my love, he said. Tell me what's hurting you. Leave me for a little, she said, and a new note had come into her voice. A note of resignation. Let me think for a little. She kissed his face and held it between her hands. She looked at him with yearning. Darling, I'm trying to do what's best for us. Please believe me. But it's terrible. I'm in a frightful... She wept again, clutching him like a child with nightmares. He soothed her, stroking the long black hair and kissing her softly. Go away now, she said. I must have time to think. We've got to do something. She took his handkerchief and dried her eyes. She led him to the door, and there they held tightly to each other. Then he kissed her again, and she shut the door behind him. That evening, most of the gayness and intimacy of the first night came back. She was excited, and some of her laughter sounded brittle, but Bond was determined to fall in with her new mood, and it was only at the end of dinner that he made a passing remark that gave her pause. She put her hand over his. Don't talk about it now, she said. Forget it now. It's all past. I'll tell you about it in the morning. She looked at him, and suddenly her eyes were full of tears. She found a handkerchief in her bag and dabbed at them. Give me some more champagne, she said. She gave a queer little laugh. I want a lot more. You drink much more than me. It's not fair. They sat and drank together until the bottle was finished. Then she got to her feet. She knocked against her chair and giggled. I do believe I'm tight, she said. How disgraceful. Please, James, don't be ashamed of me. I did so want to be gay. And I am gay. She stood behind him and ran her fingers through his black hair. Come up quickly, she said. I want you badly tonight. She blew a kiss at him and was gone. For two hours they made slow, sweet love in a mood of happy passion which the day before Bond would never have thought they could regain. The barriers of self-consciousness and mistrust seemed to have vanished, and the words they spoke to each other were innocent and true again, and there was no shadow between them. "'You must go now,' said Vesper when Bond had slept for a while in her arms. As if to take back her words, she held him more closely to her, murmuring endearments and pressing her body down the whole length of his. When he finally rose and bent to smooth back her hair and finally kiss her eyes and mouth goodnight, she reached out and turned on the light. Look at me, she said, and let me look at you. He knelt beside her. She examined every line on his face as if she was seeing him for the first time. Then she reached up and put an arm around his neck. Her deep blue eyes were swimming with tears, and she drew her head slowly towards her and kissed him gently on the lips. Then she let him go and turned off the light. Good night, my dearest love, she said. Bond bent and kissed her. He tasted the tears on her cheek. He went to the door and looked back. Sleep well, my darling, he said. Don't worry. Everything's all right now. He closed the door softly and walked to his room with a full heart. <laughs>